Are Gaurav, we going I'm, live? Uh, uh, yes, sir. I'm confirming. Oh, Gaurav, I think we are live now. Yeah, we are live now. Yes. yes. Okay. Go ahead. So, that's Hi. Uh, sir, I'll be introducing you. Uh, hello, everyone. Myself, Dr. Jasmine Marwaha, co-founder of Global Outreach Medical and Health Association, co-founder of Global Outreach Forum of Endodontics, and co-founder of Global Outreach Journal of Dental Research and Education. The Global Outreach Medical and Health Association is a global organization which has firmly established a leadership role in medical and health sector. And now I'm back with another renowned speaker, that is Dr. Donald I. Rothenberg. Talking about him, Dr. Rothenberg, He'll be celebrating the 48th year of clinical practice in 2020. In 1971, Dr. Rothenberg graduated with honors from Tufts University School of Dental Medicine. In 1972, he practiced as an associate in Brookline before opening his own practice in Saugus Amity. In 1977, Two associate dentists and a support staff of 20, Dr. Rothenberg relocated his practice to Lyon Union Hospital, substantially growing the practice. In 1985, while expanding his practice at Lyon Union Hospital, Dr. Rothenberg enrolled in the first ever long term continuing education implant program at Harvard University School of Dental Medicine. Today, we'll be discussing about his experience. So, before moving ahead, I would like you guys to register yourself for CE at www.gomha.org. The participation certificate will be solely presented to all those who are compulsorily a GOMA member. If anyone is not having the GOMA membership, kindly register for it. We'll share a link containing a form which has to be filled in between the session. The form will be valid for two hours after the session ends. And the form will be unique proof for the participants' attendance for the respected session. So after the submission of the form, the certificate of participation will be directly posted on your email addresses within seven to 15 working days. Thank you. Now we'll be going to talk and have certain a discussion with Dr. Rothenberg. So hello, sir. Hi, how are you? I'm good, sir. I'm perfectly fine. How are you? I'm fine. I could use sir, a haircut. You Sir, you have 30 to 40 years of experience and we want to know about the experience of implant dentistry and everything you want to tell. Okay, well, um, I really was not ready, but I'm ready now. Uh, let's see. I actually have almost 49 years in clinical practice, but I started my implant practice in 1986. Um, and while I was in the middle of the implant program at Harvard. And um, I'm going to try to go back to talking about short implants and how we got to where we are now. But uh, I remember uh, when we trained, when I trained, we were taught to use the longest and the widest diameter implant. That was what we were taught at that time, just use a long one and a wide diameter and you know everything else that went along with that. And I had a case in 1988 of my aunt, uh, my aunt Ellen, my mother's sister, and she needed a, she had a lower denture that she couldn't wear and was making her miserable, but she had no bone. And so I um, got in, I did her surgery and I couldn't use anything but eight millimeter implants which in back in 1988 were considered very, very short. And I showed the case to a few people after I was completed with just the implants. And most of the folks said, well, that's not gonna work. And uh, I had no other choice. 
So um, I did the case in 1988. My aunt passed away uh, two years ago with the implants in place. Everything was fine. And that's when I started questioning, like, why do we need these longer implants? You know, um, why not use more 11 millimeter and eight millimeter? And then the company, I used Bicon implants and then that company came out with shorter implants. And I found that these worked very well. And I also found out that the crown to root ratio, which we were taught when we were in dental school of one to one, didn't really make sense for implants. I could use a eight millimeter implant and make a 20 millimeter tooth. And, you know, we started thinking a little bit differently. We started thinking about um, that implants are not teeth, that implants are implants and teeth are teeth. I tell that to my patients. I say teeth have teeth problems and implants have implant problems. You got to take care of all of them the same. And so this evolves for me to the point of uh, Bicon coming out with a six millimeter implant and a 5.7 and then a couple of years ago, a five. And I don't use the five very much, but I use the six a lot. And um, they just work and they work fine and they uh, eliminate a lot of problems like staying away from the inferior al alveolar nerve, staying away from a sinus, staying away from another tooth. Um, and, you know, you can work in the maxilla without maybe having to do big sinus lifts. Maybe you do a, a crustal sinus lift, a little bit of a lift, but, you know, it, it, it just has uh, evolved in my practice where I have complete confidence in, in, in the shorter implants. And I know a lot of folks don't yet, but I, I, I've noticed about five, six years ago that most of the implant companies are starting to make shorter implants and shorter implants and shorter implants. I think there's a company even now that makes a four millimeter implant. And so, you know, like we've done and, and many of my colleagues have done that I know from Facebook and all around the world is we have never stopped looking for new ideas. Um, in my practice, we started about 10 years ago using things like PRF. And we use that routinely in almost every surgery to create bone and create tissue and create, get better healing. And we use the, the Vasha burrs and, you know, all these things. And when I changed my practice from a general practice that did a lot of implants to a complete implant practice in 2012, 2013. And uh, it, it, it's been wonderful. Um, I really like to concentrate on what I would like to do. And at this stage of my career and my life, I'm 73 and I have no plans to stop. I had an uncle who practiced until he was 88 and I plan to beat that. So um, I don't know if there's any questions or things that people want to ask in particular, that would be helpful. Thank you, sir. So wonderful. And how many years have you done short implants? I've been doing implants since 1985. Say that again. So for how many years you have done short implants? Since 1988. Since 1988. Wow, wonderful, sir. And why uh, any, what is the importance, I mean, of short implants? Do you want to tell something about I can hear you say that again. Say that again, please. To the Hello? new graduates about the short implants, anything you want to tell? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, can you suggest something uh, to our new graduates? Can I suggest uh, something? Uh, sir, could you hear me? I can hear you, but you're breaking up a little bit. Okay, sir. Uh, do you want to suggest something to new graduates about uh, anything about uh, short implants or something? Yeah, uh, to, new, to, to new people starting out in, in implants, uh, maybe a general practitioner or a periodontist or an oral surgeon starting out with implants. I know the oral surgeons and the periodontists have more experience when they start out, but 
I think, I know for me, it was the case. I had a great mentor. I had Tom Driscoll. We became great friends. He was the inventor of the Bicon implant. And so we became friends. And um, he really taught me so much. Um, he's not a dentist. He's a um, bioengineer. And um, I just really learned a lot from him. But I think the key to... Um, to getting, becoming successful in implants. And I don't mean just financially, but you know, having your implants work and, and work long-term. I have many cases that are out there 20, 30 years. And um, you know, the, the key in the beginning is to start slow. You know, pick an implant where there's a lot of bone, where it's pretty straightforward, where, you know, and build up your learning curve. It takes a while. There's a long learning curve. I've seen cases of, uh, unfortunately, of people taking uh, a couple of weekend courses and starting doing uh, all on fours or all on six, and they wind up in my office as a disaster. You know, and, and it's really terrible for the patient, terrible for the doctor. It's just uh, people tend to jump on this, and maybe not all people, but you know. They get very enthusiastic and they want to go ahead, but it's it, it's a slow learning curve. And take the time to learn how to do one or two implants together. Take the time to learn how to do the prosthetic slowly with your lab. Take the time to read, to research, to do all the things that you need to do, which got you to where you are today. Uh, to could you that. hear me? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Continue. Well, I have a, a very, right now, I have a very small practice. I have, a, um, I only work three and a half days a week. Um, it's totally implants and surgery and implant prosthetics. Usually every morning is surgery. Um, and I have uh, three full-time staff. I have a secretary and two dental assistants. One of my dental assistants is a phlebotomist. Just she's the one who takes blood for PRF. Um, it's a very efficient practice because it's small. I've had bigger practices, very big practices, and I, I prefer this at this stage of my career and my life. It's just very controllable. I know with the virus out there, with COVID-19, we were able to close down. I'm still paying all my staff. And uh, hopefully in a week or two, we can get back to a little bit of work. I had to do some work this week, but... Um, this has been a trying time for all of us. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that I always try to keep in the front of my mind is we're all going through this. It's not just happening to me or to you, it's happening to all of us. So we're all in the same boat. And hopefully this will end soon in a positive way and we can get back to what we love to do. And uh, that might be dentistry or surfing or tennis or auto racing, or the, just the things that I miss so much. Um, but this has been a time for me of watching a lot of webinars and learning a lot from my colleagues. Um, I, like I said, I'm 73, but I, you know, I'm still learning. I want to learn. And I think that's the key to any new graduate, middle graduate, or even us folks who have been around for a while. The people that I know are on the cutting edge of learning new things. And they're exciting things. These are exciting times. Um, and we have to be enthusiastic about what we do. We have to really love what we do. Because uh, if, if, if you're not, then you're really not going to become you know, a good practitioner. Um, I just love to work with people. I love to help people. And this 
specialty of implant dentistry, of implantology, I really get to see the results of helping people, whether it's one crown on one implant or an all on six or an all on eight. Um, it's been very rewarding. It's been very rewarding. And short implants have been a, a major part of that. And I was so happy to see other companies jumping on board. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I enjoy seeing all everybody's work. I see these young folks in their 40s and 50s, which is not so young, but they're very experienced. And, uh, you know, I really learn from them um, a lot, a lot. Uh, I think to have an open mind and to, uh, to respect uh, everybody for what they have to say and you either, you know, you take it in or you, take, you don't listen to, you know, you don't agree with it, but you still, I still respect the new things that come out, even though I might say this is not for me. But anyway, um, if anybody has any questions or comments, I'd be glad to answer them. Thank you, sir. And there's one query that what is better, width or length? Say that again slowly. Uh, sir, what is better, width or length? I think it depends on the situation. Um, I can use a, a, a longer implant. I mean, I have them in the office. I rarely use anything longer than 11 millimeters. That's very rare. But um, I use uh, five, six millimeter implants. So I might use an eight by six in the molar region. Um, in the anterior region, I might use an 11 by four. So it depends on where I'm putting the implant, what kind of bone I'm putting the implant into. Um, it depends on, you know, looking at my CBCTs and getting all my measurements beforehand and planning out the case. The hardest thing for me to learn in my beginning was not to just sit down and do some implants, but to have a plan before I did the implants, before I did the surgery, um, so that when I got to the surgical part, I knew what I wanted to achieve. When I first started, there was only one implant and it was maybe between two teeth and I just knew I had to put the implant in. And, uh, you know, but, but now I think it's very important to plan out exactly what you do. I don't use any guided surgery. I think that's a, a, a factor of, you know, when I started doing these, I've always done them freehand. I might use a surgical stent, which I make out of a denture and I cut off the whole lingual palatal part so I can see where the teeth are going. So I see where I want to place the implants, but I very rarely use those. And that's just what I was talking about. It's a matter of experience and experience takes time. Hopefully experience um, will, you know, make your life a lot easier, but there's no, there's no easy pathway to get that experience. You just have to do the work and ask questions, find a, find a person who's a good mentor who can help you through those steps. And, um, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, we all don't have all the answers, but sometimes the questions bring up other things and it's important to understand you know, the whole patient the patient's medical history, the patient's problems. Most of my patients are older patients. And so older patients naturally take a lot of medications. Um, they have medical conditions, they have chronic medical conditions. And these are all the things it, that we have to look into. It's a total patient we're dealing with, even if we're just putting in one implant. Because if we put in one implant, say on a diabetic, and we don't know they're diabetic, that's gonna be a problem. So I would encourage everybody to, you know, with an older patient or even a younger patient where you have questions to, we always write a letter. We call the, the patient's physicians, 
And then we follow it up by email and a letter and ask them to write us a letter back to clear the patient. Um, this is just so I know that the doctor that I'm speaking to is giving me all the information I need. Most, most physicians don't really like to write a letter back, but you know, I've made um, inroads in that because I practiced in the same area. I practiced about 20 minutes north of Boston. And I, I, I have a lot of physician friends and acquaintances and colleagues. And I've been around a long time. And uh, so I get, I get those letters from the doctors without too much complication. And recently I've been, uh, just as an aside, I've been working as a volunteer in the hospital near us, the North Shore Medical Center in the emergency room for people who come in with COVID, um, with, with toothaches in, the, you know, in this crisis. And the emergency room can't handle, you know, toothaches. So we try to help them out a little bit. And, you know, I'll stay and help out some other people. If, as long as I'm geared up with all the gear that you wear, I'll stay in the hospital and see if I can help people in some way. I feel so helpless. I feel like I want to do something. You know, we as dentists, I, I, I'll speak for myself. I am a fixer. I fix things. That's what I know how to do. I fix teeth, I fix other things, but, uh, you know, not being able to do that has left me, uh, well, I've read about eight books in the last four weeks, not dental wow. books. Wow. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's, cra it's crazy, but it's crazy for everybody. So I hope everybody stays healthy and I, I hope, uh, you know, I can answer some questions if there are any. Uh, very well explained, sir. And we got one more query. Uh, any tips on how to identify and approach a good mentor? How to identify uh, what? Uh, so we just got a question that any tips on how to identify and approach a good mentor? An approach with what? A good mentor. Oh, a good mentor. Uh, Huh. Well, I mean, I mentor a few people right now. I have a, a young fellow that I help out in Australia. I have another fellow in South Korea. Um, go on Facebook, go on to the dental implant groups, find somebody who, you know, you can relate to, you can talk to and, um, ask them if they'd help you. Um, I know most of us who have been doing this for a while are very um, aware that um, people need help because we did. I remember when I first started, Tom Driscoll was a mentor, uh, Paul Schnittman was a mentor, um, uh, Jerry Nisnik was a mentor, uh, even though he drove me crazy, but he's he, he helped me a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I asked people, I asked a lot of people, Tom, you know, Tom Chess in California. And now I have mentors that uh, are, are, you know, Sam in Moscow, Howie Gluckman in South Africa, Augusto Oliveira in Brazil, um, Tom DeWitt in Belgium. These are all people that I have great respect for. And they're all a lot younger. They're probably 20 years younger than I am but they have so much in experience and they've taught me so much. Because basically in 2010 and 11, I was a general practitioner that did a lot of implants, but they were fairly simple cases. We didn't have PRF, we didn't have too much bone grafting we had to do. So, you know, since I changed the practice, it's just implants. And there was a lot of stuff that I had to learn and because I had the experience, I was able to learn it quickly. I'm, I'm very lucky as I'm uh, a little bit of an aside story. I, uh, a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, I went to my doctor and I said, uh, I think I might be getting uh, old or dementia or something. My memory is just awful. And he said, no, you just get you know, a little bit older. It's no big deal. I said, no, I, this is more, I said, okay, well, we'll test you. We'll have you tested. I'll send you to a speech pathologist. They'll start the testing. We'll see what happens. So I took the test and a couple of weeks later, I found out that I was mildly autistic and uh, dyslexic. 
And I asked the therapist, like, uh, what do I do about that? And she said, ah, I don't know how you got through dental school and any of this stuff. I don't know how you're doing what you're doing, but just keep doing what you're doing. So that's what I do. But, um, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit longer for me to learn new things. But I do have another ability, I guess, because of the autism, is that once I see something done one or two times, I simply know how to do it which is a great gift. It's uh, something from God. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been able to do things. I've been able to listen to people like Howie Gluckman and Maurice Salama uh, and, 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 you know, just these wonderful people who are doing cutting edge things and, uh, you know, learn how to do those and incorporate those into my practice, but only after a lot of experience only when I felt confident that what I was doing is something that I could achieve in my own personal practice. Great, sir. Uh, we got another query. Uh, the question is, what do you think dentistry will look like after COVID? What do you think it will change? I think it might change a little bit. I don't think it'll be a major change. I really don't. I think, well, uh, you know, dentists have been on the cutting edge of infection control for a long time in the United States. So there's a lot of things we had to do. And, and in my practice, we very specifically do those. We may have to add some things. I think there'll be minor things. Uh, since the COVID crisis has started, we take uh, temperatures of the patients before they walk in the office. Um, we have a questionnaire that we, my secretary asked them over the phone the day before, have you had a cold? Have you, you have a sore throat? Is anybody in your family sick? Have you been in contact with anybody who's had the, the virus? All those kind of questions. So the people we see, we kind of screen pretty carefully, but you know, it's, it's a risk. And that's why we, you know, I double mask. I do double mask. I don't double glove, but I double mask. And uh, I don't know if it helps or not, but it makes me feel better. I use a face shield some of the time. It gets in my way. But I use safety glasses. We use gowns. We put a, what we do in the practice, we put a sterile gown on the patient. When they walk in our operatory, they, they step right into a gown. And that covers all their clothes. And it just covers them. Um, we've been doing that for three or four years, and uh, I like the gown on the patient. You know, our chairs are covered and all that's covered, but putting the gown on the patient covers up all their clothes. We also ask them now, uh, very recently in the last few months, uh, to, to the morning of their surgery to take a very long shower to wash their faces for five minutes things like that. So we've incorporated a few things, but I don't think we'll see any changes that won't allow us to practice dentistry. We'll just have to go about it in a little uh, safer way uh, in relation to a virus or things like that. All right. We have another question that how may a patient separate between a good and a bad dentist. Okay, say that again very slow. We got a question that how may a patient separate between a good and a bad dentist? Between a good and a bad dentist? Yes. Ah. Okay, well, you do your homework. I mean, you there's so, Google and all those things and you can go online and read about things. Um, I have my pa new patients come in to our practice. We meet them for a short visit initially um, to see, you know, to meet me. Sometimes um, I'll, I'll give them a call before that short visit if I have time to introduce myself. So when they get to the office, I don't have to explain who I am. Um, you know, I, I it, it, it's tough for the patients to tell who's a good and who's not such a good dentist. I, I don't think there are too many really bad dentists that do, do things wrong on purpose, but there are maybe not, their skill level may not be up to other dentists. That's what I mean. 
Um, occasionally we see things that are done that are, you know, kind of, um, kind of borderline for what, you know, we do in this country. And then I'll ask them when they had it done and it'll be in another country or another dentist and the dentist isn't there anymore. And, you know, um, I think also a, a, a good thing to do is for the patients to talk to their friends who have a dentist and they're happy with that dentist and they haven't had any problems and they like the office. I always tell my patients, find a gen dentist with a great hygienist that has a wonderful hygienist because that's going to be the person that's going to take care of your implants. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's hard for the patients. I mean... It's hard for the patients and you know you, I say to the patients that you need to ask the, the, the dentist uh, a few questions like where did you get your implant training? How long have you been doing implants? How many implants have you done? And if you think that's going to embarrass the dentist then uh, then you're not going to get the information you need. Um, so most most so my colleagues who do this um, will be happy to answer those questions. Great, sir. So how do you manage your personal and professional life? That's a good question. Um, at this stage, like I said, I practice three and a half days. I used to practice five, even six days in my younger days, but I practice three, three and a half days, three days in the, in the let's see, from May till October, and then three and a half days the rest of the year, maybe even four days if I need to. Um, we see a lot of patients in my practice that have been to other implant dentists in quotes and come in because they have major problems. And um, that's only because uh, I'm sort of known in the area as an implant, they know, people know that our practice is only implants and people around here wanna to go to one dentist that does the whole thing. They don't wanna to have to go to an oral surgeon and then back to the general dentist and then maybe back to a prosthodontist, especially in the time like now. I mean, they wanna to go to one place and have that one place do the work. And I, I started that when I, when I started doing implants, I said, I'm gonna do the whole thing because I wanna be responsible for the whole thing. I don't want, I think the worst thing for a patient is to have the implants done by XYZ oral surgeon or periodontist and have the prosthetics done by ABC prosthodontist or dentist and something goes wrong. And that patient is stuck between two dentists. And that is not a pleasant pace, place for a patient to be. And uh, you know, we as dentists have fairly strong egos. That's how we got to where we are. But we have to learn to temper those a little bit and listen to the patients. And I try to never say anything about negative about other work that was done. I just tell the patient, listen, this is what I can do to help you. And they'll start to say, well, this was done wrong. I said, listen, well, I can take you from today forward and fix your problems. I can't go back and it's a waste of time to go back. It's all worry, it's a, just, just a waste of your time. So if you wanna do it, do it. But I'm gonna take you forward and make what you have correct make you so you're whole again with your teeth. And again, whether it's one implant or the whole arch, doesn't matter. Um, it just doesn't matter. You have to take them forward. If you dwell on the past, you're really wasting your time. It was, thank you, doctor. It was very informative and it was very wonderful session with you. And uh, it was really a great session, full of energy, very no knowledgeable, and I hope our graduates or people will learn a lot from you. So we are grateful for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experience in this summit. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, I hope it was useful. If anybody would like to talk in the future, just look, up, look me up on Facebook. 
and uh, send me a personal message or a private message and I will get back to you. I love working with younger people. Okay. So we'll be back with our next session in a few minutes. For okay, more thank you very much. Thank bye, you, doctor. Bye-bye, uh, sir. For more information bye. regarding certificate registered speaker schedule, visit www.gomha.org. Till then, stay tuned, everybody. Thank you.